Hello and welcome everyone to New Hampshire Peace Action's Peace and Justice Conversation Series online. Uh, I'm Will Hopkins, Executive Director of New Hampshire Peace Action. And if you're new to us, we educate, mobilize, and organize to build a more peaceful and just future for all. We envisage a future where international relations are based on cooperation instead of competition and conflict, and where mutual benefit and shared security lead to a more peaceful, and just global community. The corona pandemic spurred us to start this bi-weekly conversation series. Now it's uh, about three years ago as a way to continue our public education work. And we found it so effective that we've decided to continue on indefinitely. This bi-weekly conversation series is intended to help us engage and sort out how to make the changes that we've all been yearning for. In the spirit of understanding and respect, we want to take a moment to acknowledge that we're doing our work here in New Hampshire on the tra traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We want to honor with gratitude the land and waterways that they've been stewarding for thousands of years throughout the generations. Tonight, we are excited to bring you Brother Moji Aga. Uh, Moji is an Iranian-American, a reformist Muslim Sufi monk. He is a bilingual poet and writer. Uh, and he has uh, founded a few projects, uh, most notably for tonight, is the Iranian Nonviolence Project, which seeks to connect folks in Iran to peace activists here in the US. Um, to build connections and synergies and support one another uh, in order to prevent warfare between our nations. Uh, Brother Moji considers himself a Chomskyist activist and has been for four decades. Um, he has an extensive academic and professional background in criminal psychology, in uh, clinical psychology, not criminal psychology, forgive me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> cultural and ecological studies and conflict understanding and healing. Brother Moji's peace, justice, human rights, democracy, and interfaith dialogue and Mother Earth activism includes uh, a few different projects that I'm not going to go through, um, but I've had the pleasure of being one of Brother Moji's guests uh, in his conversations with folks in Iran, as has Amy. Um, and it's such a joy to have you with us tonight, Brother Moji. Um, why don't you take a few minutes and talk to us about your work and uh, what you're... Uh, what you're what you're doing thank you so much i i i appreciate this opportunity to be the voice of the voiceless and i thank new hampshire peace action to organize this talk and and uh i am very happy to be here and uh i want to introduce uh the two co-hosts of iranian nonviolence which is a weekly, every Sunday, 10 p.m. Iran time, uh, essentially two and a half hour discussion uh, between Iranians in and outside Iran, as well as Americans and other people, whoever who wants to come to Clubhouse. And I want to introduce my co-hosts. One of them is Jim Block, and the other one is Brother Jim, as I call him, and then the other one is Amy Antonucci, my, who, who I call Sister Amy. And, and Jim, may I ask you to say just a few words about how is it that you ended up being the co-host of Iranian Nonviolence, to my delight? Yes, sure thing, Margie. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm a 74 year old retired psychologist, clinical psychologist and army, uh, officer turned, uh, peace and nonviolence activist. Uh, I'm, uh, like Moji, a Bernie Sanders fan and, uh, uh, <laughs> yay, Bernie, uh, and, um, uh, I met, uh, I'm also a member of uh, 
uh, Veterans for Peace, which is where I met Moji. Uh, he, uh, he engaged with uh, the chapter where I was a member of Veterans for Peace in, uh, in Colorado, in northern Colorado, before I moved to Texas. And uh, 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 in addition to my contact with Moji through Veterans for Peace, I, uh, I was intrigued by the work he was doing and uh, kind of pushed myself on poor Moji. And uh, uh, he's been patient enough to put up with me and to uh, uh, give me the privilege of, of co-hosting Iranian Nonviolence with him. Thank you, and and you are reviving Chapter One Twenty Six of Veterans for Peace in San Antonio. Uh, yes, tomorrow uh, I have my first meeting with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Veterans for Peace National Membership Coordinator, uh, and uh, she and I will be talking about trying to reactivate and revitalize the San Antonio, Texas Veterans for Peace chapter. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, uh, for one reason, uh, I see it being uh, 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 able to uh, engage and collaborate with Iranian Nonviolence uh, Project and uh, be of mutual benefit to both uh, the project and to the chapter. Thank you. and. And of course, Amy is our other co-host as possible whenever she is not busy uh, helping her goats give birth and working on the farm. <laughs> and uh, so I appreciate uh, everyone who is in this gathering and, and also the ones who may, be, may hear this afterwards on YouTube. And uh, I want to talk about Iranian nonviolence at one level, and then I will give you three frames, three structures. And uh, and and but I I please don't worry about taking notes. Please listen because you will be receiving after afterwards an outline. So this is how I teach. I say, please listen, as opposed to get distracted with, with things. So it's a low tech talk with no audio visuals and no cutesies and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so people uh, pay actual attention, hopefully full attention. And um, so Iranian nonviolence is a project that came out of for one thing, Mossadegh Legacy Institute, which I founded in 2012 with the encouragement of Noam Chomsky. And, uh, and then one of the things I wanted to uh, focus on was the nonviolence uh, legacy of Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, who was overthrown by the CIA and MI6 in 1953, as I'm sure this crowd doesn't need that, that kind of a elementary introduction to mm. Iran's history and the U.S. killing of Iran's secular democracy, which then caused the revolution, and then the revolution was taken over by the, the by, by people who claim to be Islamic, and uh, so so the Iranian nonviolence came out of the the. Uh, the circles of nonviolence and community collaboratives initiative, which itself came out of the Mossadegh Legacy Institute. The, the, the Chomsky endorsed and Cornell West endorsed circles of nonviolence and community collaboratives is called now intersectional circles. And uh, and uh, and then the Iranian nonviolence is an Iran application of 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 the circles of nonviolence and community collaborative or intersectional circles, an Iran focused circle, if you will. And so uh, let me just just to get 
get, get the goals of the Iranian nonviolence initiative. Uh, there are four goals, and uh, I just read them. One, talking and learning interactively about nonviolence an ethically evolved, peaceful, and collaborative approach to human interactions and to managing conflicts, especially in social, political, ecological, etc., realms. Goal number two, creating a sustained bilingual forum within which Iranian people, especially inside Iran, can engage in peace-building dialogue of undemonization, in particular, especially with the American people. Goal number three, uncovering and operationalizing for the contemporary for the contemporary world the rich and ancient heritage of Iranian nonviolence that exists indigenously in the culture and especially poetry of Iran. Goal number four, fostering genuine dialogue to non-colonially support the very hard nonviolent struggles of the Iranian people, especially inside the country, as they seek good governance, democracy, human, and especially women's rights, social justice, religious freedom in particular, ecological preservation, etc. So let me go to goal number three and speak about a very personal, uh, you know, the lesson that I learned as a child from my traditionally educated late mother. And she was a supreme manager of eight children that I, you know, in terms of raising eight kids. And among the ways that she had learned from the culture, from her traditional, not a whole lot of education, but her traditional education was this thing that when, when, when the children, especially my older brothers and sisters, I was too young. Uh, I was born in 1958, five years after the coup. Um, but when the children would quarrel and fight and compete for whatever, my mother used to tell without, any, without pointing to anyone, any party to the conflict. She would say, if you drop your end of the rope voluntarily, the fight will end. If you drop your end of the rope voluntarily, not as in a tug of war where, where, where the defeated side drops their end of the rope. If you, if you drop your end of the rope voluntarily, the quarrel, the conflict will end. And this is something that, um, well, the kids would either do it or not do it or whatever, but, 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 uh, but it, 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 you know, it stayed in my ears all these years, especially as I studied psychology and conflict resolution and cultural psychology and taught these, uh, these subjects at the university level. But then I asked myself, where did she learn? The, the, that very basic nonviolent uh, way of trying to resolve a conflict. And I'll tell you some of, uh, some of the people that were her teachers and have been my teachers. One of them is Rumi, the famous Iranian Sufi poet, of which I, as a Sufi, I am very, uh, very close to or try to understand and, and emulate and, and learn from and grow. Rumi said 800 years ago, impossible to wash blood with blood, impossible. 
and if you, when I read the original version of this, he is angry. He is saying, you stupid people, it is impossible to, to, to try to resist violence with, with equal or greater violence. Impossible to wash blood with blood. And this is Rumi 800 years ago. Another very famous poet of Iran, not as famous as Rumi, Hafiz. Hafiz, who may be my ancestor, by the way, uh, I wish I could prove it, but, but anyhow, uh, he wrote 700 years ago. And I'll, I'll just read what I have written in the website of the Iranian nonviolence. The celebrated Iranian Sufi poet, the immortal Hafiz of Shiraz, wrote these immortal words of deep love seven centuries ago. In both worlds, here and the hereafter, true peace comes from these two words of, time, of timeless wisdom, if sincerely practiced, with friends, compassion, i.e. real love, with foes, coexistence, namely tolerance, sharing, and compromise. 700 years ago, Hafez of Shiraz says, compassion and compromise. With foes, compromise. Now, to me, that's the Iranian example, some of the examples, there are many other ones that, that we don't have time, but, but believe me, it is hard to have tolerance and sharing and compromise with your foes. I'm sure you have experienced foes. And, and it, is, it is equally difficult to be genuinely, really loving of, of loving of your, of, of the people that you consider friends. If you practice these two words, as he says, then you have the peace of both worlds, here and the hereafter. And to me, this is an indigenous foundation for democracy, for human rights, for respecting Mother Earth. And so, so, you know, these are some of the examples of Iranian nonviolence that I then in number, in number three, goal number three, I said uncovering and operationalizing for the contemporary world, the rich and ancient Persian heritage of Iranian nonviolence that exists indigenously in the culture and especially poetry of Iran. Now, one of the things that really compelled me to, to start this initiative is when I hear angry young people in Iran telling, talking about there is something wrong with us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have such horrible leadership, self-hatred. And when I hear such self-hatred coming from the future generations of Iran, mm -hmm. then I say, boy, while I'm alive, I need to, you know, uncover and operationalize the, the, the you know, the, the Iranian nonviolence legacy. And so, so this is the, 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 you know, the, the shortest summary I can give you in, how many more minutes do I have? We usually move to, uh, to Q&A at about 7.30, which would be nine minutes, but um, nine minutes. a few okay. minutes, one, one direction or the other doesn't, doesn't matter. And if you want to leave some time for Jim to talk. It's good. Uh, yes, that would be great. Uh, after I'm done, I, I'll give you guys three frames. You, did I say guys? I apologize, you folks, because I've been taken to task by, by, by a peace activist 
lady who said, we're not guy. And, and I, so anyhow, you folks give you, I'll give you three frames that may help organize a lot of stuff that is happening in Iran and in the United States and, and how they are related. One, a legacy of Dr. Mossadegh after the coup. He said, internal despotism and external colonialism are two sides of the same coin. Internal despotism and external colonialism, think of the Shah, the Shah of Iran and Nixon. Or, or I don't know, bin Salman of Saudi Arabia and Trump. Internal despotism and external colonialism need one another, are two sides of the same coin. However, the other way and and far more violent and nefarious of their coexistence is when internal despotism and external colonialism need one another as enemy, as, as um, George Orwell wrote in 1984. There is a need to create an enemy and to maintain animosity in order to justify internal despotism. Internal, now examples of that are Ayatollah Khamenei, the current so-called supreme leader of the so-called Islamic so-called Republic of Iran and Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel. They need one another as enemy. In the same way that in the United States, as, as you folks know, when, when Kennedy, John F. Kennedy and, and Khrushchev wanted to end the Cold War and begin real peace talks after the Cuban Missile Crisis in the US, the, the, the people who overthrew Dr. Mossadegh and others, they killed Kennedy within three months. Within three months, we have a coup that was begun in the Soviet Union by Leonid Brezhnev against Khrushchev. Why? Because internal despotism and external colonialism need one another as enemy, and that animosity in the Cold War was a cash cow. And they needed, both sides needed it. Therefore, it went on and on and on until the, the Soviet Union fell apart because its military industrial complex was much smaller. And so anyhow, internal despotism and external colonialism are two sides of the same coin, especially when they need one another or interdependent as enemy. That's one frame. The other frame is make dot, dot, dot great again. Okay, make America great again by you know who, Donald Trump. Make Iran's ancient history great again by the Shah of Iran. Make the Ottoman Empire great again in Erdogan in Turkey. Make Russia great again, Putin. Make India great again by Modi. Make Brazil great again by Bolsonaro. And these are examples of, of um, ideological populism, which has a, has a manipulative um, you know, solution for how the society should be should be organized and, and, and managed and governed. Now you may say, okay, what about today's Iran? Who is Ayatollah Khamenei trying to make great again? They are trying to, they claim to want to make Shia Islam great again. Okay, all of these ideologies whether there are economic ideologies, religious ideologies, 
national ideologies, racial ideologies. They, they decide for the society, this is how it's gonna be. It is dictated from above and, and it, it uses brutality and violence in order to achieve the, the predetermined goal of the ideological governance through high level manipulation of the public and through dividing the public between us versus them. And so the other, the other kind of populism that we know of, like some of the policies and practices of Bernie Sanders, who you see the poster behind me, that's called democratic populism. Unlike ideological populism, democratic populism does not, it, it comes from the grassroot, grassroots. It doesn't make a decision for people, a predetermined ideological uh, dictated formula for the society because it is, it is democratic in nature. That's why Dr. Mossadegh was overthrown by the military industrial complex. And that's why Ayatollah Khamenei of Iran, the so-called supreme leader, hates Mossadegh. Ideological populism versus democratic populism. Democratic populism gets its wisdom from, from the people, from we the people, from indigenous Iranian nonviolence, from democracy, for the right to vote, for the, for the right to determine our own fate versus ideological populism tries to fool you, fool people with giving them, giving them enemies. Oh, the Mexicans are the enemies. The Muslims are the enemies. The, the communists are the enemy. I mean, you know, and then, you know, in India, Muslims are the enemy. In, in Putin, uh, Ukraine is the enemy. I mean, there are so many examples of ideological populism creating enemies because internal despotism and external colonialism are two sides of the same coin. And when they need one another as enemy, that's when it is really hard, especially for we peace lovers, because we have to stay connected and have the kind of solidarity that, that is needed in order to have the critical mass to be able to nonviolently transform policy. You see how connected and how similar the struggle of Iranians and Americans in, in this case are. And so I wish I had more time to go to give you more example to make this somewhat abstract discussion, a little bit more, more, um, uh, more tangible, but hopefully perhaps in the question and answer, we can do that. But before that, I would like to invite brother Jim Block to say a few words and, uh, and then we'll have the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Moji. Uh... There's just one one thing that I would like to uh, uh, comment on, uh, and uh, uh, it's something that actually that Amy uh, uh, put a little chat comment on uh, when you were talking about uh, the conflict uh, and uh, needing enemies, uh, colonialism and despotism needing each other as enemies. Uh, Amy, you put a, uh, a comment on that there's a lot of examples of this in, in America. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that uh, connects with what I wanted to comment on, that uh, in, in my work with you, Moji, uh, in Iranian nonviolence, I can, and it happened again just this last Sunday uh, on May uh, 
May 7th. Yesterday. Yeah, I uh, I keep uh, experiencing uh, similarities uh, between the struggles that we that we're facing here in America and the struggles of the Iranian people against the the current uh, religious re regime uh, there, and uh, find myself uh, feeling drawn closer and closer together to with the people of Iran and and what they're trying to accomplish, uh, these peace and, and nonviolent leaders trying to accomplish in, in Iran, uh, which is one of your one of your four goals that you created for us in Iranian nonviolence, having the uh, the dialogue and discussion between Americans and and Iranians and and finding that uh, uh, we're similar in so many ways and and struggling with some of the same difficulties. Can you give one of the examples in Texas where you believe you poor lonely <laughs> peace activist in Texas? Well, yes, in 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 Texas and in Florida, we have governors who uh, who are uh, uh, suffused with uh, fundamentalist Christian religion uh, and and try to govern uh, based on that. Uh, that religious uh, dogma as opposed to the more democratic kinds of uh, uh, populism that you talked about. And so uh, uh, while I, I was glad to move to Texas so that my wife Zubita could be in a place that's more similar to where she was raised in Morocco, I find myself uh, feeling a bit overwhelmed by the, the political and religious uh what i call neo-fascism in texas I, so i i i, I don't want to take up a whole lot of time my 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 singular point was that uh that the the goal of bringing americans and and uh iranians together in Iran the iranian nonviolence project certainly has an example in in me as one of the co-hosts beautiful thank you i just want to make one point that I, I, I often say, uh, I say, um, if the KKK that claims to be Christian, if that is, if what KKK practices has practiced, especially in the past, is an, is an example of Christianity, then the so-called Islamic Republic regime is practicing Islam. And that that usually shuts a lot of people up. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm using that term, but but it's like helpful on both sides. Right. Um, Helps people to understand what the regime is to Islam. Right. Um, so we've got some questions in the chat already, and I just want to encourage people. You can uh, use the hand raise function in Zoom, but I might not always see you right away if you do that. But if you put an asterisk in the chat, I will notice. You can also feel free to put your questions in the chat if you don't want to read. The, you don't want to uh, ask them yourself, and I will read them off. Um, and to kick off conversation, Brother Moji, we already have a question from Tom that I'm going to expound on a little bit. Um, and Tom asks, how can we make peace profitable? I think one of the challenges as American peace activists that we face is that peace makes jobs in, in military manufacturing. It uh, funds uh, electoral politics. Both parties get large donations from Pentagon contractors. Uh, it is a... Uh, there is a, um, a a function of of war money in uh, in funding our uh, news agencies, um, and it it becomes uh, very very difficult to fight because there's so many jobs and so much money arrayed against peace. So Tom's question: How can we make peace profitable? Um, do you have a response to that? Wow. If you do, I'm I'm very curious to hear it. Well, uh, maybe we should. Rather than put the emphasis on profitable, how about making peace effective? And Erica Chenoweth, who is an endorser 
of this of the Iranian nonviolence, by the way. Um, she talked about and has done extensive research on 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 how uh, you know how is it that that people who are engaged in peace, justice, environment, human rights, democracy, whatever good good cause. And she showed in her research that when 3.5% of the population of the country is actively engaged in, in a, you know, in the struggle, then a structural reform can happen. Nonviolent structural reform can happen. And, and nonviolence has been more, more successful than, than violent resistance and women-led nonviolent movements have been more successful than men-led nonviolent movements. And you can, you can do the Google and, and, and search research. And so what I have seen in my experience in the US and, and in Iran, the regime fights any kind of movement toward organizing any kind of movement, it crushes it at, at the butt, as, as, as they say it. And because they know once you get a significant portion of the population actively engaged, then, then you can alter the trajectory of national policy, whether domestic or, or foreign, away from warmongering and toward peace, okay? And once we have the critical mass, now in my, in my experience in the US as a, as a peace activist of, with four decades of at least experience and, and some, some knowledge, um, I know that we have more than 3.5% of the population engaged in various kinds of uh, causes. The problem is that we are so fragmented. We are so incredibly um, atomized that we don't have the, the critical mass that is needed in order for peace not to become profitable, but to become effective. Once peace becomes effective, then it can, for example, in environmental policy, it can it can steer steer policies away from destructive fossil fuels to renewable resources. So peace becomes profitable. As long as we intersectionally collaborate across cause. And that's what the purpose of of the intersectional circles that I referred to earlier is, and we'll send you the link to intersectional circles. And, but notice goal number four of the Iranian nonviolence, fostering genuine dialogue to non-colonially support the, the very hard nonviolent intersectional struggles of the Iranian people, especially inside the country, as they seek good governance, democracy, human and especially women's rights, social justice, religious freedom in particular, ecological preservation, etc. Do you see the intersectional structure of this goal? If we could have, and, and I am hoping to, to that the intersectional circles of in my recent mini speaking tour. Uh, and I've mentioned this to Sister Amy and Brother Will, that if we could have a intersectional circles start online if necessary, and then to, and then hopefully in different regions. So Amy, did you want, did you want there, to- There were a couple, that? yeah, I was gonna say there were a couple comments while you were talking um, that came up and, and one was from Amy maybe rethinking our economic system. The use of GDP and what we consider to be profit is going to be, is, is, uh, 
is going to need to change to make peace more valued. So, uh, you know, maybe it's not a question of of money, but of what we what we value. Um, and then Tom uh, just just echoes you saying peace and progressive groups are very fragmented, making us powerless. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've got some questions that I know I wanted to ask. I don't want to uh, take up time as facilitator. And I know Kyle has one that he might be working on or uh, um, maybe we'll see that in the chat or maybe Kyle is ready to ask it soon. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. This is about some recent email traffic I've seen. I'm, uh, I'm a former board member of Vets for Peace and I, I know there's been some discussion. So NIAC, the National Iranian American Council is the organization that historically for the last 14 years, I've gone to for advice for how to talk about and think about US-Iran relations. They're, they, they're kind of the the, the peace groups go to the, the peace movements go to on Iran policy. Um, and in the recent Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran truce that was brokered by China, um, they released a statement saying that it's likely to be a net positive positive for regional security, that uh, you know, there there was some, you know, let me just read a little piece. It's impossible to ignore that the US, which initially supported these regional de-escalatory steps in Baghdad appears to have ceded the role of mediator to China. This follows the U.S. de-emphasizing diplomacy with Iran, even, at, at, even as it has accepted and continued to enforce the maximum pressure policies of Trump that it once sharply criticized. So I was, uh, I was delighted to hear that Saudi Arabia and Iran had, had reached a peace because I felt like it made it less likely to uh, result in a war. But I, uh, I have read that you're not necessarily in the same boat. And I want to hear more about why. Can you, can you tell me about that? Absolutely. First of all, this poor Nayak has been attacked by, by, the, by the Israeli lobby on the one hand and by Ayatollah Khamenei on the other. Why? Because nonviolent and democratic forces need to be crushed if the animosity that internal despotism and external colonialism are interdependent upon need, you know, if, if, if this kind of animosity is to go. So Nayak has, has been getting it from all sides because it's in the middle. It's like why Dr. Mossadegh was overthrown with the, with the collaboration of the CIA and the Soviet Union. Okay, so uh, as far as why I am concerned about about the, I'm not. First of all, I welcome any kind of de-escalation. Otherwise, I, I you know I wouldn't be a peace activist. However, the one of the people who is in Evan prison, Dr. Taizadeh, Mr. Taizadeh, one of the Nelson Mandela's of Iran predicted about a month and a half ago when the news of the Saudi-Iran reconciliation happened, he said, I fear this is going to be opening to in the world, softening up to the world while hardening up inside. The road to democracy, the road to peace goes through democracy. The worst nightmare of Benjamin Netanyahu and Ayatollah Khamenei is a democratic Iran. This is why the nascent nation of Israel, five years old, collaborated with the CIA and MI6 in overthrowing Dr. Mossadegh. Democracy is something that gives people, we the people, democratic power. And therefore, warmongers and war profiteers and the ones that need one another as enemy, although they yell that we are, the other side is the enemy, we are the people of God. You know, the, the, the so my Dr. Tadzadeh said from Evan prison, I am worried about that the regime is going to crack down on peace and democracy uh, and human rights inside Iran at the same time that it cozies up 
to the to that brutal, equally brutal regime in in Saudi Arabia. And of course, the broker is no no champion of democracy. I mean, China is not exactly a paragon of democracy and and justice itself. So so and and then the Russians, the Putin, is also for this rapprochement. All of them benefit from the people of Iran being strangulated under sanctions. The regime, on the one hand, benefits from the sanctions, therefore it keeps it going. The, the Israelis benefit from it, of course. The Republican Party in the United States benefit the military industrial complex. Russia benefits from it. China benefits from it. The people who are being crushed economically, democratically, socially, culturally, are the people of Iran, resulting, for example, in my nonviolent, non-political family, finally, my niece at age 50 something and her husband have to flee Iran in order for their future, for their children to have a future. So I say, I welcome de-escalation between the the, 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 that Saudi brutal regime and the Iranian brutal regime on the one hand. However, if the policy of cracking down internally, even harsher on democracy, is the price to pay for a softening up on the, to, the, to the Saudis, um, then, then, then one needs to question, you know, like, so I say, I bring this up, and I brought this up at a at a at a pro at a program, the so-called Middle East expertise program on KGNU in in uh, Denver and Boulder. And boy, I was treated like trash. And they, they didn't allow me to talk. Why? Because the people who are part of this program have an ideological populist decision they have made there, there are a couple of leftist people and the gentleman from Iran their Iranian expert is had gone had spent a month and a half only a month and a half ago he spent a month and a half in Iran and he was parroting the the propaganda of the regime well, thank you. I, I wanted to, uh, you know, I There's saw that there was some. There's a lot of information I can give you. We don't have time. Yeah. No, yeah. I appreciate you going into it a little bit because it was, you know, both the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Yemen and the agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia brokered by, by China were, were both hopeful steps. And I agree with you that China is a, a not, not a great or democratic regime and, and not one that should be trusted, but it, it's interesting that they've stepped into a role of becoming mediator. Then um, I think Nyack is right that we've, the United States has really ceded that role and, and, and left that space open for China to step in. Um, Kyle, did you want to ask your question? Well, he had his hand up. There we go. He's not unmuting. Well, we've got some questions in the chat, so I'm going to take that as a no for now. And Kyle, if you figure out how to get your uh, get your microphone working, you can jump in, or again, you can feel free to pop it in the chat, or I, I'll get to you in a minute when you come back. Um, for now, I'm going to ask Greg's question. So Greg asks, would you say that 3.5% or more of Iranians are involved in nonviolently protesting against the hijab rules in Iran? If so, does that mean that, that there's a chance that they'll be able to change the rules, even though the Iranian government is executing some of the protesters? Way more than 3.5% of the Iranian people, way, way, way more, are sick and tired of the un-Islamic imposed hijab, un-Islamic imposed hijab, and I'm saying it as a Muslim, as a Sufi. Imposing hijab is un-Islamic. It's like if, if KKK is Christian, then imposed hijab is Islamic, okay? Way more than, way more than 3.5% of the Iranian people are against imposed hijab, while some of them are perfectly fine with, with hijab when it is chosen, 
by 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 women and men. However, the the problem with with the with the Iranian population that it is under brutally harsh repression, therefore they cannot come together and they cannot they cannot build that 3.5 percent because the regime well knows well that that it is hated. That's why Ayatollah Khamenei said about two weeks ago, referendum, people are too stupid to, to know the you know, real analysis. He is afraid of a referendum because he knows perhaps 80% of the Iranian population is sick and tired of, of fascism that pretends to be Islamic. So there's a question from Amy that feeds right into that. And it's, many of us are so inspired by Iran's recent ongoing activism. How can we here in the U.S. help to support Iranians with their nonviolent struggle? What can, what can we do? Oh, boy. One of them is to come to Iranian Nonviolence Weekly program, <laughs> and of which Amy is a co-host when possible. And, uh, and the other one is... Uh, to to you know to give voice to the people who are who are silent the silent majority uh, of Iranians outside the country uh, they they are I mean I keep getting threatened by the goons of the regime on a regular basis on Clubhouse and I've been told. I have an in absentia execution order from the from the circuit number 15 of the revolutionary court in Iran. Why? Because the regime does not want the voices of peace and nonviolence to become prominent. Instead, it actually perpetuates violent voice of overthrow at any regime, at any price. So, so on the one hand, external colonialism feeds overthrow at any price. The regime, internal despotism, perpetuates keeping power at any price. What is their common denominator? Violence. What is needed in order to stand up to violence? Nonviolence. Thank you. Thank you, Moji. Um, and I just want to take a moment to recognize that you've, you've said a few things that um, I want to make sure that we make a, just a little space to recognize and that the, the struggles of your family, your niece trying to get out, um, and also your own death warrant, um, just how hard it is. You know, sometimes we take for granted some of those rights that we enjoy um, to safety and security and the safety and security of our families. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for your bravery in speaking out um, and to recognize that your, your, your family is uh, in danger from this brutal regime. Um, I want to see, Kyle, are you ready with your question? Can you hear me well? We can. All right. I want to ask about one thing in particular, the Iranian space program, because last I heard you guys had skateboarders. And if I know anything about people who work in the space programs here in America, the United States of, it's that they're usually pretty good at skateboarding. So if there is a direct link between Iranian skateboarding and the Iranian space program, I want to know about it because I want to meet those individuals. I believe in them. and. Last I heard, there's a writer's strike, Star Trek is up for grabs, and there has never been more than one Iranian cast member in a sci-fi exclusive. It was, uh, it was, I'm sorry, you, you could finish, you could finish for me, Starfleet out. Well, if, if, Thanks, if, if, if you want some crazy Sufi to be a actor, uh, although I don't have any actor training uh, in a sci-fi sci sci movie, just just send me an email. Uh, and as far as the Iranian space program, 
its Iranian space program is a fig leaf in order to justify the brutality of the regime. Basically, the regime says, although we are extremely backward uh, in terms of our cultural and social policy, but look, we are so technologically advanced. Same thing in the Soviet Union. The space program of the Soviet Union was a way of trying to, to, to justify and be a fig leaf over the brutality of Stalinism and Brezhnevism. So I, I'm sorry if I'm turning your humorous comment or question into a serious one, but it is a serious one that the, the whole thing about the, the Iran's uh, so-called uh, nuclear energy program is another example. Although we are extremely backward, but look, technologically we are advanced. Okay, understand that because the regime is, it doesn't have any legitimacy. Therefore, it tries to have legitimacy by, by pointing to its shining points. In this country, I'm a, I'm a you know, Bernie supporter. So look at American mainstream media propaganda that shows how wonderful this country is, how wonderful <laughs> this country is advanced, yet, the people are living in apartments, apartments, loneliness, incredible need for care. They don't tell you that much, of, much about that. And then when Bernie tries to point to the shadow of this country, then, then they don't let him become the democratic nominee. They have coups against him in 2016 and 2020 uh, presidential elections. So, so external colonialism and, and ideological populism, regardless of what clothes they wear or what they claim, because they know they don't have democratic legitimacy, they try to create a spectacular stuff in order to distract people from the real ills of the society. Thank you. Jim, did you have a comment you wanted to make? And we're just about at the close. I'm going to give a few upcoming events, and then we'll turn off the stream. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I've got had something come up here at, at home, and I, I wanted to just apologize. I need to leave uh, precipitously like now. So my apologies for having to disappear. Well, thank, thank you, you for joining us, Jim. Well, thank, thank you for ha being uh, having this forum where we could uh, talk and, and exchange ideas, and and it's been wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Unfortunately, I, we are I at have, the end of our time together. I have so, no life, but I, I stay as long as you guys stay. <laughs> all right. We'll we'll uh, we'll let folks stick around in the Zoom room after we close the stream. But before we close the stream, I just want to mention a few upcoming events. So a week from tonight on Monday, May 15th, same time, 7, uh, seven to 8, we'll be hosting Nora Zakarna, um, who's going to talk about growing up in Palestine. She's a young woman who's here uh, going to law school in New Hampshire. Uh, but grew up in Palestine. Um, some folks in her hometown have been killed while she's been here studying, um, and she just wants to tell her story. So join us a week from today for that. The next day on Tuesday, May 16th, uh, you can join. Amy will be hosting our quarterly New Hampshire Peace Action Act. We're going to try to get our get some calls into our House representatives about repealing the Iraq authorization for the use of military force. It's passed the Senate and we need to get it through the house. Uh, so two Mondays from tonight, we'll have some folks from Friends Forever Northern Ireland who are gonna talk about youth peace, peace building efforts in conflict areas. Uh, and then two weeks later on June 5th, we'll be hosting Jerry Condon and Helen Jacquard of the Golden Rule, who are gonna talk about Veterans for Peace Golden Rule Project, which is sailing around the world, uh, trying to put an end to nuclear weapons. Um, so I'm going to say, say good night. Do you have a before, last comment before I turn off the stream? Well, before, before, before you uh, 
uh, end the recording, the guest of the Iranian Nonviolence this coming Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time is Richard Forer. Richard Forer is a Jewish American uh, former member of IPEC, who is now a fierce defender, nonviolent defender of Palestinian freedom. So I invite you and everybody to come to the Iranian nonviolence, which is available on Zoom as well as Clubhouse, and I, you know, and then invite others because we need more people to 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 show that peace has a chance. And they, they, um, John Stewart said jokingly, yes, the arc of history bends toward justice. However, that bending is not as a result of gravity. That's right. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Moji. Moji, um, this series is free and open to the public. Uh, but we, we welcome and need your support. So check out nhpeaceaction.org front slash donate. You can also check out nhpeaceaction.org front slash uh, events for our upcoming events. And um, we will see you next week.